Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. I, I want to thank everybody for uh, coming here this afternoon. It's a nice sized group here for Condon. And, uh, but it's a really dismal topic, the opioid crisis uh, in the United States in particular, but it's uh, somewhat of a worldwide phenomenon uh, as well. I did my dissertation here at Auburn University on the economics of prohibition, and I wrote several articles in academic journals and popular publications with the Mises Institute and other places for many, many years. And as we got into the 2000s, uh, I was hired to be a macroeconomist, and I saw that we were winning the war on drugs, at least the preliminary steps, and I kind of lost touch in terms of my academic work with the war on drugs. And then a few years later after that, I realized that this opioid epidemic or crisis, as it's been called, uh, was spreading very, very rapidly, and it was killing more people uh, than in the war on drugs on its own. Okay, so the war on drugs on its own was killing uh, in the general range of 10,000 people per year. Uh, the opioid crisis quickly eclipsed uh, those awful, tragic statistics. And so for the last six or seven years, I've been lecturing about the opioid crisis for the last three years here at Mises University, but literally everywhere I go. So if I go out to eat with some friends, I talk about it. If I go to the Kiwanis Club, I talk about it. If I go to the Lee County Builders Association luncheon, I talk about it, even though my, uh, my real talk might be on something completely different because this epidemic that's got a hold of us collectively uh, here in the United States is really ruining, in addition to killing people, it's ruining uh, so many people's lives. Uh, it's hurting the economy. Uh, it's actually undermining some several different government budgets. Uh, so it's having pervasive effects uh, on us as Americans, even if you aren't directly affected so far from this awful problem. And basically, the big problem will, you know, I'll, I'll tell you where this is all coming from. But the biggest problem now is actually in the area of legal drugs, legally prescribed drugs um, in the economy. We're going to see who is responsible for all that. So this is the chart I used last year uh, in this class. And you'll notice that the total number of deaths, overdose deaths, um, from 2000 to 2015 it tops out at about 10 people per 100,000. And then there are prescription drugs, heroin, and other synthetics, most notably fentanyl, uh, who, which has killed several celebrities. Um, these are spiking, whereas the prescription drugs have leveled off. Uh, but the total is still rising here. Now for this year, Looking at 2016 data, notice that total opiate overdose deaths has risen to above 13. So that's a massive increase of overdose deaths involving opioids in just one year. So we've gone from about 10 last year in 2015 data to over 13. And there's been some changes down here. They've broken out methadone from prescription drugs, but as you can see, heroin and other synthetic drugs has increased in number significantly. So a lot of people uh, are being fooled by these synthetic opiates, and it's causing a lot of deaths. Okay, so what we're talking about here is things like Oxycontin and Vicodin, and there's about a half a dozen of them all together. And basically, the big pharmaceutical companies have encouraged these developments. There's something called the Pain Prescribing Guidelines set by a panel 
that meets in Washington, D.C. occasionally to suggest guidelines so that all doctors share the same guidelines as to what to prescribe under certain circumstances. This group of doctors, scientists, researchers, uh, in my mind, were basically bought off by the pharmaceutical companies in the form of grants, in the form of travel, in the form of speaking fees, in excess, in, in many cases, of over $100,000 per year. Uh, and this panel uh, changed the guidelines in the early, uh, in the 2000s, uh, so that now opioid prescription drugs can be prescribed for just about everything. Okay, so in the old days, typically speaking, these drugs were used in hospital settings for cancer pa terminal patients, things of that like. Uh, over the last several years, if you're a high school football player and you wreck your shoulder, you get Oxycontin. If you're a miner or a fisherman and you get hit with a piece of equipment and you're injured, you now get one of these opioid drugs. Uh, if you fall down the stairs and break your leg or whatever it happens to be, uh, the guidelines now suggest that you, sh you the doctor should be giving you these opioid painkiller drugs. Okay, and most of the time the patients don't even know what they're taking. And uh, so they went through a big campaign, not just with the committee, uh, but they also touted various research uh, for example, this one letter to the editor for the Amer um, Journal of the American Medical Association, which was written by a graduate student, it is quoted in many of these research papers, and she was involved with a study while a graduate student that monitored 40,000 people in hospitals where patients were given Oxycontin, Vicodin, etc., and only four of those patients subsequently became addicted. So 0.01 of 1% became addictive, and this letter to the editor was widely quoted in this campaign to get doctors to prescribe these powerful painkillers. Of course, if you're, you're usually in the hospital just a few days, um, you're usually only given these painkillers in the hospital for a few days, and you're being given them uh, by nurses and, and so forth, so you're under direct supervision for short-term use. That usually does not lead to addiction. It's longer-term, heavier use where people very often get physically addicted and then dependent upon these drugs. Okay, so the prescribing guidelines encouraged their use by doctors and patients. Uh, physicians were otherwise encouraged to follow the guidelines. If you don't follow the guidelines, you could be sued. For one thing, you could be possibly arrested. And also, insurance companies and Medicare do patient surveys of their clients to determine whether you, the doctor, adequately treated them. And so if you're expecting to get a prescription, if you're expecting to get a powerful painkiller and you don't get it, you can answer the survey and undermine the payments that doctors receive and hospitals receive. So it's not just the guidelines that change, but also the economic incentives are also changed. Okay, so now it's, it's very typical uh, for painful injuries to be treated with opiate prescription drugs, um, and you're typically given a 30-day or 60-day or a 90-day prescription. You might take one, two, three a day. In, in more severe cases, maybe four a day. Uh, and it's this level of use in terms of length and in terms of the, um, the quantity aspect that leads to uh, the likelihood or the increased likelihood of physical addiction. So moving away from that 0.01 of 1% to something much higher. So as a result, many people have become addicted. And uh, as of 2015, there was approximately 15,000 
overdose deaths from prescription painkillers. Uh, I saw a report recently that suggests that the research responsible for uh, getting these statistics uh, does underestimate the actual number of deaths because people in a situation, they don't want the cause of death you know, of your minister or your math teacher uh, or your grandmother to be listed as opioids. So why the epidemic? So we're going to separate the problems of the war on drugs from the epidemic. So the pain prescription guidelines start to change after the year 2000. By 2012, 250 million prescriptions were written in the year 2012 for opioid prescriptions. So even if everyone was given 12 monthly prescriptions during that year, that's still 10 million people getting these drugs in large amounts uh, for extended periods of time. Um, researchers estimate that 25% of the people who are prescribed misuse the drug. And misuse can mean a variety of things, not following the prescription guidelines, taking too much at one time, uh, giving pills away, uh, selling pills, all sorts of things. Of those who misuse, 10% get an opioid use disorder, and this is more directly linked with addiction. And of that number, 5% transition to heroin. So we've got literally millions of people in the United States alone who get caught in this trap. So you've got, say, 60 days, three tablets a day, you finish your prescription, you feel a little something's wrong, so you go back to your doctor and you say, I really need another 60 days, please. But the doctor's not allowed to, to prescribe more. You can prescribe this stuff for a broken shoulder, uh, broken knee, so on and so forth, but you can't prescribe it for someone who's addicted. That'll end the doctor in jail. So what do you do at that point? I'm going to jump the gun here in, in, in the slides. What do you do at that point? Well, you can go cold turkey and just not take anything. Uh, that's very, very difficult to do. Uh, the withdrawal symptoms from opioids is rather severe and is known to even cause death. So that's not a great option. Another option is you could go into drug rehab. 30 days, out of work, very expensive, tens of thousands of dollars for 30 days of drug rehab treatment. And very often it doesn't work or only works for a very short period of time. So that's not a great option either. And the third option is to go on the streets in the underground economy and buy Oxycontin and Vicodin in the black market. Uh, they're readily available in the black market. The problem is, is that they're very expensive. Uh, you can easily uh, see a price of $25 a pill for Oxycontin or Vicodin. So that's, economically speaking, not very viable, certainly over the long run. A typical person is going to exhaust their savings and their income within a matter of weeks doing that option. So this is why people transition to heroin, because heroin is almost always much cheaper than the Oxycontin and the Vicodin. So that Oxycontin and Vicodin, you might find it for $10 a dose. You might find it for $25, $30 a dose. Uh, if you buy a, a sufficiently large amount of heroin, you can get the doses for as little as $3.50. So you find in modern America in places like Maine and West Virginia and Ohio, um, all around the United States with normal people 
who uh, have normal professions but are injury prone uh, and would never, ever, ever consider the idea of taking heroin, um, taking heroin. And then, um, so 80% of heroin users in modern America start with prescriptions. So these are relatively normal Americans uh, who had no idea what was happening to them. Uh, that's changed somewhat in, in more recent years, uh, but a lot of this was people were completely oblivious to it, both the doctors and the patients. Okay, and the number of overdoses has increased dramatically uh, after those numbers that you saw uh, in the first couple of slides. Uh, in, so in 2017, uh, they think that the number is going to be as much as 50% higher than the 2016 uh, statistics. Uh, and there's a reason for that. I mean, it's almost something that you can anticipate. Um, and now it's estimated that we have two and a half million opioid addicts in the United States. I just want to mention the pain epidemic because in my research on this, I was quite startled um, that we have this epidemic of pain in the United States and Europe. A 2003 study looking at 13 different studies found that chronic pain uh, afflicted anywhere from 10 to 55 percent of adults in European countries, uh, 2006 study, 15 European countries, and Israel, the average amount of chronic pain amongst adult, almost 20%. 2011, chronic pain in estimated to be 116 million Americans had chronic pain at some time um, during, I think it was 2010 suggesting uh, chronic pain at some point in the year to be 50% uh, of adults. And I looked on Google in 2016 for chronic pain. There were 46 million hits. Last year, there was 163 million hits. And so far this year, there's 52 million hits. Uh, in 2017, the number goes up significantly because of the president's commission on the opioid uh, epidemic resulted in a lot of media coverage uh, of this story. So what's causing all this pain? I'm not sure, but it, it's out there. The face of heroin addicts has obviously changed as well. In the 60s and 70s, uh, it was the young inner city person, mostly minorities, as well as a large number of Vietnam vets. And so this was a group that most of American society didn't really care about. They didn't care if they died. They didn't care if they overdosed. They didn't care if they went to jail. Um, they were on the fringes of society. Uh, later, the demographics change, uh, but the numbers are still really low for heroin addiction in the United States. But it, it turns out that there are older African-American men start to dominate the picture, but it's mostly, it remains minority males. Today, the fastest growing proportion of opioid addicts and heroin addicts, the population is more, much more female, much more older and middle income, middle class and white. And this is where the epidemic comes in. The numbers are much larger and it's much more mainstream. Uh, in today's America. So if you read uh, about this issue in the media, uh, you'll find people saying that it's the supply side, it's the drug cartels, it's the smugglers and the dealers, it's their fault. Um, other people will say, no, it's just bad people, drug addicts, weak people, and so forth. And also, you'll see the appearance sometimes of the gateway theory of drugs where if you smoke uh, a marijuana joint, uh, you'll very quickly end up overdosing on heroin. <laughs> and I actually, I, I was invited to the Oxford Union debate in, at Oxford University, and 
the topic was should we end the war on drugs? And uh, we, you know, both sides have teams of players. Um, and the other side, the second person in charge of drug policy uh, in over there uh, said exactly that. He said if we if we allow people to smoke marijuana uh, very quickly, the entire population will be addicted to heroin. That's almost verbatim from what he said. And some people actually believed what he said, but most people in the audience laughed. Uh, of course, a lot of people blame the, the free market here. I never really could make any headway understanding that. Um, and then another one is China and fentanyl. There, there's large amounts of industrially produced synthetic op opioids in the form of fentanyl, which is anywhere from 100 to 500 times more potent um, than base heroin itself. Uh, and most people agree to all these uh, things that, yes, it's got to be dealers have got to be involved and it's got to be weak people in the free market and China. China. China's to blame for everything. These are all the reasons that are seen. Bastiat's, uh, Frederick Bastiat's the seen and the unseen. These are all the things that Bastiat would say, those are the things that are easily seen. Those are direct causes. But what's really going on here? Most of these people uh, in various print formats argue for more prohibition, more government intervention. Uh, some argue for more treatment, uh, but basically use a stronger arm of, uh, of government intervention to solve the issue. Uh, the real reason here is that, of course, heroin and these drugs are addictive. They, they really, we've known that for uh, over 100 and, about 120 years. Uh, government intervention in the economy, this is also a problem. Uh, government intervention hurts people. It, it uh, destroys them economically and so forth. That's certainly part of the original problem. Um, the law of prohibition over uh, the gateway theory of drugs. Basically, the law of prohibition is what I did in my dissertation, and it shows that the more they try to stop drugs, the more potent and dangerous drugs become, and therefore the drugs become more addictive, more dangerous, and more deadly. So th this is also part of the problem of the war on drugs. Uh, but the real problem, the real reason for the epidemic is that drug companies and the medical establishment change prescription writing guidelines for opiates. Okay, so heroin is addictive. We've known that for a long time. Uh, Bear Pharmaceuticals took it off the market, uh, and it was made illegal in 1914. Government intervention, again, this is part of the traditional problem, not the epidemic so much, but war is a big cause of addiction. The waves of addiction coincide directly after wars, such as the Civil War, the Vietnam War, the current situations in Afghanistan and in Iraq. So that's a problem. Uh, and government intervention in the form of monopoly privilege also has a hand in the traditional problem. It takes away opportunities uh, from people and suppresses their income, and then the government gives them welfare. So they become dependents of the state. Uh, they can't work or they'll lose their welfare. Um, and if they did find a job, it would be very poorly uh, paid. And I'll explain that briefly. So, but the result is dysfunctional people in need of relief and escape. Monopoly privileges, which are pervasive up throughout our economy, restrict supply and increase price. So it restricts the number of lawyers, the number of doctors, uh, the number of producers, the number of nurses, uh, so the professions are all monopolized to one extent or another, uh, restricting supply, increasing prices, but reducing job opportunities. And therefore, labor has to move into jobs without monopoly privileges. So you're trying to squeeze yourself. You wanted to be a doctor and help people, but you couldn't pass the test. So you end up in some other profession that is loaded 
with labor. And so the wages are suppressed in the competitive sector of the economy. So if you're a waiter or a waitress or something like that, you've got no monopoly privileges. It's a cutthroat job. And incomes in, in some of those areas are suppressed uh, greatly. So, um, so not, not only do these unfortunate people have lower wages, but they have to pay the monopoly prices to the people who have the monopolies. So your wages are suppressed and your prices are waged. You're being exploited by the state. You're being impoverished, and it, of course, depresses people. Um, so labor at the margin is uh, a pretty bad situation. The Iron Law of Prohibition, you can read this in my, in my book about the economics of prohibition. It's pretty inexpensive. <laughs> and it's, it's small, too. So what I found was based on this Iron Law of Prohibition, um, alcohol and drugs that are prohibited in black markets, uh, they're produced in much more concentrated form. So when I started the research on my dissertation, I wrote to the government and asked for a report where they monitor marijuana potency over in Mississippi. And so I got the report. 1972, the potency of marijuana is 0.4 of 1%. In 1984, the last year in that report, um, it was 4.4, or roughly 10 times more potent. It's now much more potent than that. And then, of course, most of the drug market is transitioned into much more dangerous drugs, uh, cocaine, heroin, uh, methamphetamines, uh, fentanyl, and all sorts of other stuff uh, have crept into the marketplace. I, in uh, revising my dissertation to get ready to submit it, I wrote back to those people in, in Mississippi, and I said, could you please send me an updated report? And they said, where did you get that report? <laughs> I said, you guys sent it to me. And, and the lady on the other end of the line said, well, you're not supposed to have it. <laughs> I said, well, I'll send it back to you. <laughs> Which I didn't. <laughs> so it, as, in, as enforcement efforts intensify, suppliers will switch to more powerful and concentrated substitutes. Uh, so we see the example from marijuana to cocaine in the 1980s when they cracked down on marijuana. All of a sudden, cocaine started flowing in. And then, of course, later on, uh, the return of uh, heroin, methamphetamines, and so forth. Uh, this also explains the so-called gateway theory. Remember the idea that if you try marijuana, you're going to end up on heroin? Well, in a sense, America was smoking marijuana, several million people were smoking marijuana, and now we're ended up um, with what the gateway theory pred predicts, but was only explained, really, by the iron law of prohibition. So this is what I've already explained, basically, why people get to the state of consuming heroin, non-legal opiates, uh, you start out with a lot of pills uh, that you get cut off, and what do you do? Well, this is the part where I skipped ahead. Cold turkey, bad uh, choice, drug treatment program, expensive. It doesn't work very often. Uh, and also, even if it does work, say you went in 30 days and you come out clean, you stay clean for a long time, if for whatever reason you go back, and you go back to your old dose, that's where a lot of the deaths occur because you've lost your tolerance to the drug. And so if you go back at that same level, chances are you're gonna fall asleep and never wake up again, like David Gordon right there. <laughs> oh, he did wake up. And go back to sleep. <laughs> so again, the black market seems to be the only easy choice uh, you, here's where you get the high prices, the uncertain supply, and that, of course, is if you're a heroin addict, uh, that uncertainty is driving your life. You're basically, um, you know, you wake up and you 
figure out where can I get some money and where can I get some drugs and things like where can I get a job and, and no, more normal things? When can I uh, uh, apologize to my girlfriend or something like that? Those are not issues that drug addicts um, are thinking about. So we end up with a lot of people um, dying of non-legal opiates. Okay, and the reason we're seeing so many people die from the black market heroin, actually some of the stuff is is actually pretty clean. The, the stuff that's coming in from Mexico, black tar heroin, it's fairly uniform. Uh, you're not going to be injecting it. You're going to be smoking it. And it's of a relatively constant purity, not pure, and potency. But most of it, of course, is not commercially or pharmaceutically uh, made. Uh, it has impurities. And the powdered heroin is always unknown and highly variable in terms of its potency. It could be just a few percent heroin. It could be um, almost pure heroin. Uh, one of the biggest problems is that they're using fentanyl um, to spike up the high you get from low-potency powdered heroin. And then a lot of this stuff is the fentanyl being added. It's coming in in vast quantities from China. Um, and it's, you know, a hundred times more potent than powdered heroin. So it's, it's a real killer. So we're getting, as of last year, uh, 21,000 overdose deaths per year. So the, um, the total number of people dying from overdoses is now about 60,000 Americans per year. Um, the vast majority of that is prescription and non-prescription opioids. Um, but Americans are also dying from just regular prescription drugs, anti-anxiety medications, psychoactive medications. Um, Americans are taking so much prescription drugs um, that it's not surprising, given the complications and the interactions uh, of drugs and the fact that we're seeing a regular doctor, a doctor on vacation, a specialist, and so forth, uh, that people are being overprescribed. Uh, two years ago, there were enough prescriptions written in general so that every man, woman, and child in America received, on average, 13 prescriptions. Yeah, that's a real tummy tosser. Um, so what are the available solutions? The right says lock them up. The left says lock them up. <laughs> of course, neither of those work. They've been trying that for decades, um, and it doesn't work. And treatment, again, has a high cost and a low success rate. Uh, my solution is to legalize drugs, uh, including opiates and cannabis. Uh, cannabis legalization is happening all around the United States, uh, it's one of the ways that addicts themselves say helps them deal with addiction and get off and reduce their pain medication. Um, and so I would definitely throw that in there. It doesn't seem like it fits here, uh, but it very much is um, a part of the solution. In terms of legalizing heroin, um, that sounds a little dramatic as well, but when you look into the addiction process and the addiction industry, uh, they know they're up against a lot of issues. Getting somebody off of heroin um, is just one aspect of the issue. These people, by the time they reach some kind of professional treatment, are not just addicted. They're probably um, at odds with their family, their wife, their girlfriend, their boyfriend, etc. They probably lost their job and are marginally employable. Um, and so they've got many more problems than just addiction. And if you, the experts in this area say, if you can't solve the social problems that go along with the medical problem, uh, then it's not going to work. So my suggestion is to allow doctors to prescribe maintenance heroin doses um, of a pill variety 
And um, so that the addict has as much time as necessary to get their economic and family and friend life back together again. And, uh, and to do so in a way that the addict knows they're gonna, they have a supply of this. They know that it's not going to cost them much money. So they're not worried about that. The number one worry about of addicts is their addiction. Uh, if they don't have to worry about this in terms of the continuity of supply and the price, then they can start to work on those other problems. And anecdotal evidence says that things like uh, as people get older and into middle age, they very typically uh, drop their addiction to heroin. Uh, the same is true for wealthy people people who can get pharmaceutical-grade heroin uh, on a regular basis just because they've got so much money uh, that they can buy their way into that, they also typically uh, beat their addiction in a very rather normal fashion. So legalization turns the, turns the whole situation around so that the drug addicts are not worried about their addiction. They can concentrate on these other problems. So that's basically my approach to it, um, where doctors can prescribe maintenance doses, uh, can meet with the patient on a regular basis, uh, test them if necessary to make sure they're not taking anything else, and addicts can solve their own problems on their own in the long run. At least some of them can. Right now, we're, we're just losing way too many people on a daily basis. I think it's 137 Americans every day. And that's 137 American families that are just about dying every day. Okay, so the conclusions are that, is that this epidemic is numerically very real and deadly, and it goes much beyond those numbers because it's typically young people that are dying in, in large numbers or mothers and fathers uh, with little kids that are dying. Um, so it... The, the death actually permeates into a number of different other people. Uh, the cause here is big pharma and prohibition. And I think that uh, legalization would certainly reduce the problem uh, of the opioid epidemic. Uh, we can look at things like the decriminalization of all drugs in Portugal in 2001, and they did not have a complete social meltdown. And actually, most of the social indicators associated with hard drug use have actually improved in the country of Portugal uh, since that time. Thank you very much. And we, we have a few minutes for questions. So I'm from Appalachia. Uh, I'm from Australia specifically. The last year we had like 26 overdoses and six hours or something on one day. It's a pretty close topic to home. I was wondering if you looked at any like region-specific factors, uh, especially like how Appalachia is still plagued by it. Yeah, uh, Appalachia is, is definitely hard hit. Um, there's, you know, if you look at West Virginia and Ohio, that whole area in there, uh, the number of prescriptions that have been written in those places, there's a lot of pill mills, um, and uh, so the number of prescriptions that have been written in certain counties and the noteworthy ones are in Appalachia, um, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. The numbers I gave you, about 13 prescriptions per year per American, well, I mean, it's way beyond that. It's like in some counties there's like 25 prescriptions written for every man, woman, and child. Um, in a lot of cases, these pills are diverted and resold for money. So the poor people of Appalachia are not just being addicted and dying, but they're, they're trying to lift themselves up a little bit um, uh, by reselling these prescription drugs, which are slightly less uh, dangerous. But that it's definitely, um, you know, it's like the Southwest, people are using this black tar heroin from Mexico. It's less deadly. Um, but, you know, in places like New Hampshire, uh, the number of victims, uh, you know, and just places that you just typically do not associate with heroin addiction at all um, are 
a lot of big time anomalies. How much of this do you think is just bad incentives by Big Pharma? And how much is it dedicated and organized genocide by the government? I think in, in this case, I like, like the way you're thinking there. Uh, <laughs> and there's enough blame to go around. Um, but I would say it's, it's the pharmaceutical companies that are driving this. There's three main ones. Um, that are involved, but I think all of them have an opioid uh, pill uh, in their roster. Uh, but they're making billions. I mean, they're they're making just unbelievable amounts of money. Uh, they're rigging the system, just like a lot of the pharmacy industry is being rigged, where one person buys a drug uh, and then raises the price from five dollars to five thousand um, dollars. There's all sorts of crazy nonsense going in, on in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that we give them monopolies for the pills. We extend the monopolies longer than they should be. And uh, I'm trying to think. There's, there's one. Oh, yeah. And then the insurance companies, Medicaid, Medicare, insurance companies are picking up the bill on this. Uh, and so the people who get the prescription, I got a $10 copay, I go to the pharmacy, pick it up. They don't even look at it. Um, Medicaid Part D, which provides cheap prescriptions for senior citizens, uh, is hemorrhaging money uh, because of the number of seniors who are out there getting multiple prescriptions um, and dying. Uh, if they take it, uh, the, the, their chances of dying increase, or sometimes they're just getting the pills to resell to enhance their income. Can I speak more on the decriminalization of Portugal and maybe how, how uh, your idea of legalization would be? Maybe there's some similarities there. Yeah, uh, in Portugal, they, they, legal, they decriminalized all drugs, and... Uh, the government didn't know what to do, so they appointed a commission of doctors and just um, upstanding citizens, and they came to that conclusion. So they were given the authority to do it, and it provided cover for the politicians. And, uh, you know, everybody said that Portugal's going to crack off and go into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but basically, if you get caught with hard drugs in Portugal... Uh, they might give you a citation. Uh, they might require you to go to see a counselor or a social worker or an addiction counselor, uh, but there's no monetary penalty. There's no jail time. Um, and as a result, we've seen improvements in things like transmission of HIV through dirty needles, um, you know, just things like that, overdose deaths, um, muggings, you know, that where addicts would mug people to get money for their for their drugs. But it's still illegal, and they still put dealers in jail there. But it's been uh, a nice uh, result. The UN monitoring uh, arm, for, you know, their bureaucracy to monitor the drug problem is in Lisbon, Portugal. And they want, they want to do the same thing worldwide, except I think they, at one point they realized that might put them out of a job. Um, <laughs> and, um, but it's been a marginal success. Yes, sir. Um, so perhaps not with Medicare and Medicaid, but don't uh, regular insurance companies have some incentive to, couldn't, couldn't they issue their own guidelines, like we're not going to, pay for opioids less meet our guidelines so like it can't be good for them i assume if all these people on their plans are feeling over don't they have any incentive to try and i think i think um some plans uh do that sort of thing i don't know if they do it in connection with this but i think like kaiser you know where they where they're managing your whole health uh and they're putting restrictions on what you can and cannot get um, they definitely do things like uh, requiring you to take one medication before they're willing to pay for the much more expensive version. So I would assume that, they're, that they could, 
and probably would um, uh, be thinking along those lines. I was going to ask, how would this undermine the, like, I guess the black market of the drugs coming in into the U.S. with that there would not need be a need for, like, drug enforcement agencies and things of that nature? Yeah, we're starting to see some changes already. The legalization efforts in places like Colorado and Washington for marijuana, uh, Mexican farmers who used to grow marijuana now find it it's not profitable to do so. So they're going back and raising things like corn and you know other crops uh, because marijuana is not as profitable and potentially could get them in trouble as well. So this can have penetrating... Uh, impacts across society. We're already seeing uh, things like in the cannabis legalization states, uh, fewer prescriptions for anti-anxiety and psychoactive drugs and all sorts of things, and fewer overdoses. Uh, so we're making improvements marginally, but this problem is still steamrolling along because we have so many addicts now that if we cut back on them and we don't properly treat them, they're going to go and get these black market drugs. Inevitably, they're going to get something with fentanyl in it. And that creates the possibility of overdose. Last one. Uh, how do you feel about the injection sites in Seattle? I don't really know about them, but the idea of providing free needles or at least allowing the sale of needles uh, has done a, a large amount of good. Uh, one study broke down countries that were absolutely prohibitive of needles and then others that provided free needles and others that put restrictions and you had to pay for them. And there's no question that the places where you can access clean needles or you're given free, uh, clean needles has greatly reduced uh, the amount of blood transmission type diseases like HIV. Um, there's six or seven of them that uh, really are horrible for people. Um, and so the results have been, worldwide, they've been uniformly good. In the countries where they simply do not allow anyone to sell clean needles, uh, those are also the places, the highest rate of HIV transmission. Okay, so that's great. Thank you very much. I'll get your question.